Okay, today I would uh, like to continue our observational overview of active galactic nuclei. And today we're going to talk about two topics. We're going to talk about uh, active galaxies viewed over many decades in size, what I call AGN powers of 10. And uh, then I will talk about the black hole region, the region very closest to the black hole that is often studied in the X-ray band. So let's start with uh, AGN powers of 10. So many of you, I imagine, are familiar with this very famous movie called Powers of 10, made originally by Charles and Ray Eames, although there are many uh, adaptations of this. And this uh, short film uh, explores the universe uh, viewed on different scales. It starts with a couple of people uh, at a picnic, and it then... Um, starts zooming outward by powers of 10 each time. Not all of the powers of 10 are shown here. They zoom out, uh, out above uh, Chicago, and then you see the Earth, and then you see the solar system, and then they move out to the stars and the galaxy. They even move out to show all the galaxies. And then they go back in, zooming in on the man's hand and a skin cell of the man's hand and a carbon atom, well, the DNA molecule, uh, DNA molecules, and then th their constituents, and then uh, atomic, an atomic nucleus, and then down to the, the quark level. And um, the, the point here is that uh, complex uh, uh, systems, in this case, they're taking on the whole universe, are often uh, best understood when you view them at a variety of different size scales. And so, Active galaxies, being a complex system, also benefit from that kind of a perspective. And uh, thankfully, uh, someone, uh, in this case, Professor Pat Hall uh, up in Canada, has made a very nice uh, set of images, uh, which again are the AGN powers of 10. This is uh, the first one of these, and I'll show several more in, in the next slides. Um, this one basically shows the region close to the black hole. In this case, uh, Pat is considering a non-spinning black hole, and it is shown in terms of its radius along this axis and units of gravitational radii, which is half of a Schwarzschild radius, so it goes out to, you know, two gravitational radii. And then it shows an accretion disk, uh, which truncates at an innermost uh, stable circular orbit, which in this case is at six uh, gravitational radii. So that's radii in units of gravitational radii. And then to make things a little more concrete, Pat has also uh, very nicely added the radius in units of astronomical units, uh, specifically worked out for the case of a black hole with a billion times the mass of the sun, uh, a very massive black hole, one that might power a, a luminous quasar. And then for comparison, well, here you can see numbers showing the size and astronomical units. And then over here, you can see the, the distances of uh, various planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, Eris, and so on. And um, so you can see this black hole, uh, a billion solar mass black hole, is impressively large, filling up most of the inner solar system and it even starting to push out toward the outer solar system. Okay, so that's the, the first order of magnitude. And then if you zoom out uh, somewhat further, well, here is uh, a plot showing radius, in this case, again, in units of gravitational radii, going out to 10 gravitational radii. And then over here in practical units, this goes out to about 100 um, astronomical units. And then here, can very conveniently, are also labeled orbital times, which on this sort of a size scale are of order days. And this region here is the region we'll be talking about for most of uh, this lecture, the so-called black hole region, the region where, for example, we believe the X-ray emission is largely produced. Um, and Pat has also very nicely here, I'll just point out, uh, shown uh, different uh, spin cases of black holes, and each one with the corresponding shading has its corresponding uh, innermost stable circular orbit shown. And so again, for a non-spinning black hole, which goes out to two gravitational radii, the disk uh, truncates at uh, six uh, gravitational radii, whereas for a uh, maximally spinning black hole, uh, the disk can extend all the way down to the event horizon as shown with that shading there. Okay, so that's that scale. 
Now we're going to move out by another of order of magnitude with this uh, image on the right. Uh, this one now, instead of going out to 10 gravitational radii, goes out to 100 gravitational radii. Now the orbital time scales, again, for a billion solar mass black hole, are of order many weeks, going out to a year or so at the edge, at the edge here. And now we're talking about um, many light hours, going out to like 140 light hours from the system. Uh, this is the region where we believe uh, an accretion disk, um, although there's some debate over this, but where we believe an accretion disk uh, produces the ultraviolet optical continuum emission that we see from active galaxies, from thermal emission or semi-thermal emission from a hot disk. Uh, this is also the region where, you know, at, at a minimum, where we know that jet launching and magnetohydrodynamic collimation uh, exists. We have now managed to image jets down to of order uh, 10 gravitational radii or so. So we know the jets are formed initially on very small size scales. And so the jet is very nicely shown here. And uh, moreover, um, what's shown here is a star. Uh, remember that these active galactic nuclei, of course, are in, in a galactic nucleus and down in the, the center of our galaxy. And we certainly know this, know this for a few other nearby galaxies and expect it to be the case generally, that there's a very dense stellar core uh, comparable uh, to the stellar density of a globular cluster or perhaps even more. And so even on this rather small size scale, you might expect there to be a vort or a star or so. Okay, on this sort of a size scale. And we'll see more stars on the next slides. So that's this uh, size scale. Now we're going to go out to a thousand gravitational radii with this uh, slide here. So now we're going out to a thousand gravitational radii uh, corresponding uh, now to like 58 light days, again, for a billion solar mass black hole and, and having orbital times of order many years. Okay, as shown here. Um, so now we're going out to the region where we believe much of the line uh, emission is produced, much of the strong and broad line emission that we see from active galaxies, from lines such as helium-2, carbon-4, silicon-4, H-beta, magnesium-2, and so on. This is broadly the region where we think uh, that emission uh, arises. Um, and note that different lines are thought to uh, be largely formed at different radii. We'll talk much more about that when we talk about the broad line region. Um, this is also the region where uh, we think significant uh, equatorial obscuration, this obscuring torus that I've alluded to earlier, uh, is thought to begin existing. This is the innermost part of this obscuring structure, which may extend out to much larger scales, as I'll show uh, soon. Um, so this obscuring torus is thought to start to become relevant on this size scale, likely due to the ability to start forming dust uh, in this region. Dust is starting to AP, start, dust, dust is uh, becoming able to survive uh, the, the intense uh, ionizing radiation, which is present on, on smaller size scales. And so this is the region where obscuration, for example, in the optical and ultraviolet and so on, starts to become quite important, at least for systems viewed equatorially. Um, this is also a, a region now where there are significant numbers of stars. Now, each one of these little dots is representing where one might you know, expect a star. Clearly, we don't think the stars are in a grid pattern as shown here, but it's just highlighting that you expect there to be a significant number of stars in this region. So one should think that, well, maybe stars may have some role on what regarding what's happening on these size scales. And indeed, there are models that have put that forward. And then here is the jet continuing along. Now here uh, we go out, instead of just going to a thousand gravitational radii, now we're going to go out to uh, 10,000 uh, gravitational radii. Now the orbital time goes out to hundreds of years. And, and now you're talking about a physical size scale, okay, going out to like 1.6 light years or so. And so here is that little broadline region we talked about earlier. This is this obscuring torus, which can, at least in some cases, can extend out to very large sizes. So the torus uh, spans a significantly large range of radii. Um, and this is also the region where we observe many outflowing uh, winds uh, to be present. Uh, we observe, uh, for example, broad absorption lines, which I talked about in the first lecture, and other absorption lines, which may often be formed in this region. Sometimes they may be formed also on smaller scales. And we also have good evidence that some, at least 
a good fraction of the time, many of this, these uh, broad absorbing light clouds are on even larger scales as well. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about outflows. Um, here is now then the inner edge of the narrow line region. There's another line emitting region that produces much narrower lines than the broad line region. This is the inner edge of that narrow line region, which again, we will discuss in more detail later on. Also, uh, when you get out to these large size scales, this is where we think the accretion disk may start to come to an end. Um, at, on these large size scales, there can be enough mass in the disk that it can become unstable to gravitational clumping, and, and that may be a natural way to terminate an accretion disk out on these size scales. And note, here is the jet continuing along, uh, along this axis in, in this plot. And now note the many, many stars that, that are expected to be present on uh, this size scale as well. So that's that size scale. And unfortunately, that's where Pat stopped making his diagrams, at least to my knowledge. But uh, there are other um, similar uh, plots that have been made. Here is an earlier one made by uh, Roger Blanford. And remember, here you're going out to a size scale of about 1.6 um, light years or so. And so here's a little schematic going out to 10 parsecs. Okay, where you can see the stellar core and a strong stellar cusp and the jet continuing along. Here you go out to the narrow line region where you see now um, the, the sort of larger extent of the narrow line region material. Um, and then you go out to a kiloparsec. And on a kiloparsec, well, now you're getting out to you know a significant fraction of a galaxy. Uh, you may have a warped galactic disk. You may have a bar present, which is responsible for uh, sending material down to the active nucleus to feed it. And um, there are many relevant processes on that, uh, those size scales as well, often, again, being important to how active galaxies are ultimately fueled. Then you go out to larger t uh, size scales. Now we're out to 10 kiloparsecs, where you might have a captured companion, which in many cases may trigger an active nucleus and where you may have dusty molecular gas clouds that are being irradiated and so on. And then you can go out to even larger size scales where here you see the whole host galaxy, you see the jet extending beyond the host galaxy. Uh, sometimes in uh, these systems, particularly where, when they're in a cluster, you may have gas cooling out of the cluster uh, uh, and uh, affecting the, the, the uh, feeding of the black hole. There may be satellite galaxies and so on. And, and then out to the very largest size scales, now we're going out to a megaparsec or so, um, you have, again, the active galaxy down in here. Here is the jet extending out to these enormous megaparsec size scales. Uh, you may have strong shocks producing hot spots. You may have a weaker bow shock, and these produce the, the fantastic lobes that we see from many radio loud active galaxies. So that is this uh, AGN powers of 10. And again, this is these sorts of plots are very useful for capturing a lot of information going from the black hole region, okay, out to the, the region where the ultraviolet and optical um, continuum uh, from the disk is formed out to the broadline region, uh, the, uh, the region where winds are often observed, uh, to the narrow line region, and then out to the whole galaxy and you know the full extent of, of jets. So there's a lot to cover with all of this stuff. And we're gonna try to break um, much of this down in the next several lectures. So here is the overall game plan for the next few lectures. Generally, uh, we are going to start on small scales and we're going to work our way to progressively larger scales. So the same way that I just presented those powers of 10 is broadly what we're going to follow. So today we're going to talk mostly about the black hole region. Then we'll talk about the broadline region and outflowing winds and the narrow line region and the Taurus and jets and so on. So you see there's many components of an active galaxy, we're gonna break it down into these constituent components and talk about each uh, one of them. And I will just mention that this approach of taking a complex system and breaking it down to its constituent components has a long and uh, distinguished uh, history. Here's a, another example uh, uh, made by Dante in uh, 1320, where he here tried to break down you know, the, his conception of the universe, uh, where he broke it down into hell, which was broken down into various levels where the various um, bad people went, and he put some of his political enemies in the various levels of hell. 
it's rather amusing if you read that. And um, then uh, you, you, if you went down through hell and somehow made it past Lucifer down here, you could come up through the earth and go up into uh, purgatory. And then if you were uh, very wise, you could extend up into the heavens and uh, ultimately reach uh, Elysium and heaven up here. So in any case, the point is that this um, approach of taking a complex system, breaking it down into its constituent pieces to try to understand it, has a long history. And while our uh, discussion of active galaxies um, may not have uh, the same poetry as uh, Dante, it, it does have its own unique charms. And so with that, um, let's move on to the black hole region. Uh, which again uh, it will mean for the purpose of this discussion, the region within about 20 uh, gravitational radii of the black hole. Um, <clears throat> a few words to say about the systems we're gonna use to discuss the black hole region. Uh, first of all, the black hole region is best studied <clears throat> in active galaxies without strong absorption. So the, the type one systems, the ones that we're viewing in a polar direction, and thus, we are largely going to focus on such systems here. Um, thankfully, uh, we can do that without loss of generality, at least if you believe the AGN unified model, uh, because uh, that would imply that the conclusions that we draw from our studies of unabsorbed systems should be more generally applicable. So even though we're going to focus on unobscured systems in general here, we, we believe much of what we're learning should be applicable to the obscured systems, which are in fact more common than the unobscured ones uh, when you go out and survey the universe. Um, furthermore, uh, I want to mention that the black hole region is best studied in systems where a dominant jet-linked beamed continuum that's overwhelming the light that you would otherwise see from the black hole region, uh, you want that jet-linked beam continuum to be absent. And so we will avoid in um, this uh, talk today of discussing blazars. And we will return to blazars plenty when we talk about jets. And, and um, finally, um, I, I just one other point. Uh, for this uh, talk today, I am, for simplicity, I'm going to largely focus on what we have learned about active galaxies accreting at very high accretion rates. Excuse me, at fairly high accretion rates at accretion rates above about 0.01 of the Eddington luminosity, okay? Uh, these are the systems where most supermassive black hole growth in the universe occurs, and um, systems with lower Eddington ratios, below about that value, um, where a radiatively inefficient accretion flow, or RIAF, and remember that term because we will refer to it later on, uh, is often present, um, those systems clearly are also important uh, and, and very interesting. They're fascinating. And, and they will, again, be discussed uh, later on. But for today, we're going to focus on fairly rapidly accreting systems. Okay, so let's now talk just about some general properties, so some general points here. So here we're going back to this AGN powers of 10, focusing on the order of magnitude that emphasizes the black hole region. Okay, I have a few points to make here. First of all, just to, again, to, to set the size scale, um, the radius is shown here in astronomical units. Again, for a billion solar mass black hole, you can scale that by the mass, of course. And um, you're, you're reaching out to about 13 or 13.9 or 14 light hours. So that's the size scale, okay, that we're going out to, at least as shown in this specific diagram. Um, so in this... Uh, black hole region, well, plasma is slowly flowing inward through the accretion disk via many, many very nearly circular orbits and is slowly drifting inward through the accretion disk via uh, likely magnetic viscosity until it reaches the innermost stable circular orbit uh, to which I have mentioned, which, which I've mentioned previously, also known as the ISCO. And at that point, it plunges toward the black hole ballistically. So for a non-spinning black hole, the material would slowly work its way inward through the disk, again, undergoing many, many orbits as it slowly drifted in. But then when it reaches this innermost stable orbit, it rapidly plunges down to the black hole. Okay? That's the nature of this innermost stable circular orbit. And again, you can learn about that when you learn general relativity. Um, 
So this region, as I've already alluded to, is mainly studied in the X-ray band. Pat here labels the X-ray emission region being present on this size scale. And so um, we mainly study this region in the X-ray band because that's where most of the relevant uh, radiation uh, emerges. And uh, the X-ray emission is thought to arise mostly in a corona. Okay. So here is, again, a broadband uh, schematic or a broadband spectral energy distribution of an active galactic nucleus showing here uh, the emission that, at least in our standard model, is attributed to a multi-temperature uh, black body emitting accretion disk. That's clearly a simplification, but that's you know, at least that's the simple model for these things. And, and you have, and this radiation here is coming out in the ultraviolet, in the extreme ultraviolet, okay? You can see that the emission from the disk at most may go up to a couple hundred electron volts, okay? Broadly speaking. Um, so this structure, and again, whether it's a disk or whether it's something else, there is some debate there, but this structure is not thought to be what makes the X-ray emission. There's thought to be a different component, this corona, okay, which is thought to be associated with the disc, being an accretion disc corona, and I'll show some images of what we think this is like in a little bit, um, extending up to higher energies, and that's what makes most of the X-ray emission, okay? Note that the corona does not go out to arbitrarily high energies. It does have a cutoff, and we'll talk about that cutoff and why it exists uh, in a little bit as well. Okay, so just as, as a definition then which will be relevant here I want to introduce a an important parameter which is used to basically measure the strength of the corona compared to the strength of the disk okay this parameter alpha ox is defined like this it basically is the uh, luminosity ratio at 2 kV compared to that at 2,500 angstroms, which corresponds to five electron volts. So basically you, you take a, a, a wavelength in the near ultraviolet, again, thought to be associated with the disk. You take another uh, energy, in this case, 2 kV, which is pretty squarely thought to be associated with the corona, and you measure the relative strengths of those two things, okay? Now this precise definition uh, basically uh, adopts there being a nominal power law between five electron volts and then 400 times up at 2 keV. Um, that's, this definition basically then corresponds to the slope of a power law between those two energies or those two wavelengths, okay? That's what this thing is. But practically, it is a useful way of saying how strong is the corona compared to the disk. And we have measured this ratio for many active galaxies. And here is just one plot um, showing this. And there are many studies of, of this type of thing now. And so you can see the typical value of this alpha OX parameter, you know, is typically sort of in the range, maybe minus 1.9 up to maybe about minus one. That's broadly its range. Interestingly, um, this parameter correlates with things. It correlates with luminosity quite prominently, as you can see here. Okay, in fact, the strongest correlation we generally find uh, with with um, of alpha OX is with luminosity, and, and this is the the measurements of alpha OX here, spanning a very broad range of luminosity. Okay, now this X-ray normalization of the corona compared to the disk and its luminosity dependence, as shown here. These things are empirically observed. Uh, we do not have a simple um, sort of pencil and paper type calculation, uh, which lets us predict the strength of the corona, or even less, its luminosity dependence from basic first principles. Uh, people are now working to perform large-scale numerical uh, computations, and they've had some success now in getting Corona uh, to grow, uh, although, to my knowledge, these are still not highly robust. They're not naturally predicting the overall base level of the Corona relative to the disk, and, and they're also not predicting like this luminosity dependence and so on. Okay, I'm sure some authors may disagree, but that's my broad assessment of the situation. Um, now, then, what does this mean in practical terms? Well, for most active galactic nuclei, um, basically, if you look at the total X-ray power from this coronal structure, well, it ranges between about 10 to 20 percent 
and that's relevant down here at the lower luminosities, down to about 1%, which is relevant up here at the higher luminosities of the total AGN's luminosity. So the X-ray contribution is not dominant to the total power. It's like 10 to 20%, okay, at low luminosities and goes down to just a couple percent at the very high luminosities. So that's this alpha OX parameter, and that basically is how strong is this corona component compared to the disk. That's how strong it is as best we can measure it. Okay, um, one other point about this um, corona is that while, um, again, we cannot predict it from first principles, and while it's sort of empirically um, added on to standard disk models, um, it does seem to be very robust. Uh, we know this because we can take samples of active galaxies selected at other wavelengths, take optically selected samples of active galaxies, for example, and we can look to see how common is strong X-ray emission from these systems. And, and this plot here kind of shows the robustness of the X-ray emission from the corona. In, in this case, we are looking at two sets of optically selected active galaxies. This one from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, this one taking the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and adding in another set of quasars from the Bright Quasar Survey. There are significant numbers here of active galaxies and, and careful selections have been made here to avoid systems where there's uh, complications due to obscuration. Uh, you can read this paper if you'd like to see all the details. But the point is that all of these objects, all 217 and all 139 here, they're all X-ray detected. So we know, we know how strong all of them are. It's not like we have a bunch of upper limits there. And um, basically, uh, what you can see then is we can, if you compute this factor of X-ray weakness, which measures how strong is a typical active galaxy compared to its expectations from this alpha OX luminosity relation, and here in fact is the, the relevant fit shown here. Well, basically you, you can see that um, active, well, and a factor of X-ray weakness of one corresponds to your typical expected value of X-ray strength. Some are stronger, some are weaker. But if you go down to X-ray weak systems, and again, you avoid systems that, that are highly obscured, well then, um, object you do find objects that are a factor of two times weaker than average a factor of three times weaker than average and you can see that here there's a significant scatter and this is real intrinsic scatter mostly it's not mostly measurement error most of that's real intrinsic scatter around the relation okay so uh, the, but however if you start going down to say a factor of 10 times x-ray weak well, those systems are very rare. Uh, along this axis, again, we're showing the 90% confidence limit on the fraction of quasars that are X-ray weak by that amount. And you can see objects that are X-ray weak by just a factor of, say, five, so one, two, three, four, five, only make up a few percent of the overall active galaxy population, in this case, optically selected. And going down to a factor of 10 times X-ray weak, they only make up a percent or so, and that's an upper limit on how common those systems can be. So the point is that while this coronal structure is a little bit mysterious, and while there is system to system scatter to be sure, you can count in general on there being a corona there. And here's some good evidence for this. There are many other uh, studies of this kind. Uh, here I give a reference to another uh, recent high quality study, again, establishing in general, the robustness of the X-ray emission from the corona. Okay. Um, now, you might also say, well, now you've told us about this corona, yes, it's there, but, you know, really prove to me that this emission is coming from the immediate vicinity of the black hole. What is your evidence that the corona is indeed, the emission from the corona is mainly coming from the immediate vicinity of the black hole? Well, the best evidence uh, that we have, the most robust evidence, comes from rapid large amplitude X-ray variability, which is commonly seen among these active galaxies. So this is the coronal emission. We see the coronal emission varying rapidly and by large amplitudes. And this implies a compact X-ray region. Here are a few nice examples plotted. Here's a relatively nearby active galaxy. And you can see here it's um, X-ray uh, count rate or corresponding to its X-ray luminosity doubling on a time scale of less than an hour. Okay, so this, implies that the emission region has to be fairly small in size. I mean, 
the size of, of order the inner solar system, which again is consistent with what we expected from the size from our powers of 10 plots that I just showed you. Um, here's another example, NGC 4051. Uh, look at this nice rapid and large amplitude variability continuously being seen. Here's another system, one's wiki one. And basically this type of X-ray variability being rapid and large amplitude is common. It has now been seen in hundreds of cases uh, for these active galaxies. And um, again, this X-ray variability often implies an emission region size of light hours or less, indeed telling us that this, is, this emission is coming from the immediate vicinity of the black hole. Okay, so we're in the immediate vicinity of the black hole. Well, that immediately has some other implications. This means we're going to be in a region where strong gravity is present, general relativity matters, and where relativistic motions will be present. And here is a nice uh, computed image made by my colleague and friend, uh, Chris Reynolds, um, showing the prediction of what an accretion disk would look like if you could fly in and look at it. And many people have made uh, similar plots, uh, both before and after this particular one, but I find this one particularly you know, useful. And um, here you can see that the accretion disk is clearly brighter on this side and fainter on this side. Uh, the reason for that is the accretion disk is coming toward us over here, away from us over there, and in this direction, Again, the material in the accretion disk is coming toward us and it's coming toward us relativistically. So it is beaming its radiation in its direction of motion. And that's why this side is brighter. And on this side, uh, the uh, accretion disk is beaming its radiation to some significant degree away from us. Okay, so that leads to this brightness difference on one side versus the other. And then you'll notice this general glowing emission here kind of extending upward. Much of this is due to the strong gravity effects. This is a radiation coming from the backside of the disk that is getting gravitationally lensed by the black hole's gravity up around the black hole, and you see it sitting up there like that. So that is a prediction for a smooth disk emissivity. And um, people have also worked this out for uh, perhaps more realistic disks. Here is a disk that is not uh, perfectly smooth in its emissivity pattern that perhaps has a more realistic emissivity pattern. And uh, here you can see the disk viewed at a variety of inclination angles, ranging from an inclination of only five degrees here to 30 degrees to 55 degrees to 80 degrees. So this one would be mo most comparable to the one I just showed you here. And so people can compute, people have worked out very carefully all the relativistic um, radiation transfer due to the strong gravity. They've worked out the effects of the relativistic motions and all of this stuff actually has to be included when you model the emission, the X-ray emission from the black hole region. And that is indeed generally done and will be done in the further analyses that I'll be discussing now. Okay, so now let's talk about X-ray spectroscopic studies of this black hole region. Okay, spectroscopic studies have been extremely valuable in clarifying the nature of this region. And here, uh, to begin with, is a nice schematic spectral energy distribution for an active galaxy. This one is probably most applicable to a relatively nearby, uh, safer type active galaxy. Um, and basically, it is showing the relative flux in units of sort of nu f nu or e f e here. So these are the relevant units versus the rest frame energy here in KeV. And you can see in this plot, and here is the same plot, but I've now added some, some relevant uh, explanatory text here. There are a number of continuum components. There is a power law. That is the base level emission from this corona, as we will see running along here. There is a soft X-ray excess. There's emission over and above what you would expect from the power law down at low X-ray energies. In many cases, it's not always seen, but it's often seen. Um, at high energies, you often see a so-called Compton reflection hump, a broadband hump of emission sticking up above what you would expect just from a straight extrapolation of the power law. And then um, in addition to these continuum components, we also see some discrete atomic features. Um, we see an iron K line commonly here. 
This Iron K line often has a physical width to it, which is quite interesting. We'll discuss that soon. You also see other line emissions sometimes, and we also often see absorbing outflows in these systems. Um, I'm not showing the absorption effects on this particular plot. I'm trying to keep this plot as simple as possible. So this plot here, as I noted up here in the upper right, is for the specific case of no X-ray absorption. So this is the, the cleanest we find one of these systems to be. And when you start adding absorption, things can become considerably more complex, uh, which is a challenge uh, to the X-ray spectral modelers, uh, as we will see. Okay, so... Ah, yes. So you might say, well, this is a very nice little schematic, you know, but show me some real data. Okay, well, here's some real data. In this case, for a relatively nearby bright active galaxy, in this case, there are multiple detectors that have been fit. These different colors here correspond to multiple different detectors operating on the relevant satellite. And um, the data have been fit with a power law model. Here is the basic power law. Here is the nice soft X-ray excess down here, detected very at very high statistical significance. Here is the iron line. Here is the Compton reflection hump. And then note also that this power law, as I've already mentioned, does not go on forever. There's a high energy cutoff of the power law. And here you may be seeing some evidence that the power law is starting to cut off compared to expectations there. Okay, so that's, the, that's one example of these components seen in actual data. And we have hundreds of examples where people have studied these various components in actual data with X-ray spectral analyses. Okay, so now let's talk about the X-ray spectral components from the black hole region. And we're gonna go through these one by one. Let's start with this power law that I've alluded to, this power law here. Okay, there's, there's much to be said about this power law, which again is kind of the base level emission that we associate with the corona. So as I've already mentioned, uh, unfortunately the corona's properties cannot yet be computed from first principles. Uh, progress is being made via large scale simulations. Um, but this corona does seem robustly to produce this power law emission. I want to say a few words about the corona before we start talking about all the details of the power law and what it's like. So first of all, uh, the nature of this corona, as I've just said, is remains uncertain. It's a bit of black magic sometimes involved in understanding this corona. Um, sometimes people envision it to be kind of uniformly sandwiching the accretion disk. So the accretion disk would be like the meat in the sandwich and the corona would be like the bread surrounding the, the, uh, the disk. Um, here is a, a little schematic uh, that, in fact, I made with Knox uh, Trinnell uh, in, in the department um, showing uh, a sort of sandwiching uh, corona uh, that is sandwiching the accretion disk. So, so here it is. This is sort of an ultraviolet to X-ray image, and you are seeing here coronal loops, okay, sticking up above the accretion disk. These are kind of loops kind of like those seen in the solar corona although the temperatures involved in an accretion disk corona are much more extreme um, than for a solar corona, being about a thousand times hotter. And, um, well, this, these, the, these magnetic fields, as they are constantly sheared apart uh, due to the differential motions in this relativistically moving disk, um, you know, liberate energy, feed energy into the coronal plasma, the electrons and perhaps the positrons that are there, and uh, that's what energizes them. It's, it's magnetic processes. Again, magnetic reconnection, uh, possibly also um, unbraiding of magnetic fields. That may also have effects. And um, again, I will talk a little bit more about this plot and how the X-ray emission is made and what these little things here represent in just a minute. But this is one picture. Now, again, this is a dynamical structure. So in fact, here is that same... Um, image now shown as a movie. And so you can see the corona is a highly dynamical structure. These uh, magnetic fields, we expect them to be constantly sheared apart and um, reforming all the time. Okay, so that's that vision of the corona. That's a kind of uniform sandwiching by the accretion disk. It is also possible that the uh, sandwiching may not be so uniform, but rather the accretion disk may be patchy. Indeed, this one may have some patchiness to it, even as shown here. Um, but, but here the idea was you'd have some places where the corona is fairly strong up above the disk, other places where it's not very strong. So in some places you can look directly down to the disk without having to look through the corona, whereas in other places the corona is, um, you know, 
you have to look through the corona to reach the disk. Okay, so that's another possibility. Uh, now, those are some ideas for the corona. But again, there are other visions as well. Um, some people envision uh, the corona to have kind of a lamppost structure. That is to be, uh, you know, in the center of the disk, sitting up above the black hole and, um, you know, irradiating down upon the disk the way a light on a lamppost shines down upon the ground below it. Uh, what could be that lamppost? Well, perhaps the base of a jet. So here is another uh, vision of, of what the corona might be like. Uh, in this case, you have a, a jet, and, and we know that even many radio quiet active galaxies still do launch uh, lower power jets. And so you could have the corona, in this case, being the base of a jet, which again is fairly confined, sitting up above the black hole along this, um, this spin axis of the black hole, perhaps. And um, this would be serving like a lamppost, shining radiation down upon the disk below it. Again, the same way that the light of a lamppost illuminates the ground below it. So that's one possibility. This is another possibility. I've always personally favored this one, but that may be my own biases. And we do we are gathering information about the nature of the corona from X-ray spectroscopy and X-ray variability studies, as I will talk about later on in this uh, lecture. Okay, another possibility, by the way, just in passing, is you may have an inner hot advective flow. Uh, in some cases, the accretion disk may, uh, the, the, the geometrically thin, optically thick accretion disk may evaporate and form a geometrically thick, optically thin structure and advective flow, and perhaps that could serve as the corona. These are all possibilities, and it's very likely from one active galaxy to another, uh, these all may be relevant to different degrees. Okay, and again, I'll say more about this at, later on as we start talking about the spectral and the um, variability results. As I've already said, uh, we believe the corona is likely heated by magnetic processes, magnetic reconnection, uh, and perhaps uh, unbraiding of magnetic loops. Uh, those struck, th those um, processes likely heat the plasma in the corona and keep it up at around a billion Kelvin, uh, much hotter than the solar corona, which is around a, of order a million Kelvin. Now then, how is the power law made? Well, the power law is thought to be made by Compton upscattering. Specifically, you have ultravi ultraviolet, extreme ultraviolet, optical photons coming from the accretion disk. That's the typical thermal temperature of the disk. And those photons may then be Compton upscattered in the corona. And in fact, that's what I'm showing here with this little uh, schematic here. Here you have an ultraviolet line photon originating as thermal emission from the disk. It starts to fly up through the corona. It's it strikes a um, hot, high-velocity uh, coronal uh, electron, or perhaps positron, and is thereby upscattered to become an X-ray. Okay, so that's how you make X-rays of ultraviolet light. You constant upscatter them. And again, that requires a very high-temperature corona of order a billion Kelvin or so. Now, a single scattering, as I've depicted here, can produce low energy x-rays but again we observe x-rays up to tens of keV even sometimes up above 100 keV 200 keV so uh, those um, high energy x-rays are likely produced by multiple scatterings where a single photon may scatter off one electron then another then another before it ultimately flies away to be observed so there may be multiple orders of Compton scattering and there almost surely are in these systems so that that clearly depends on the optical depth of the corona which as we will see later on can't be too thick because then it would blur out all the observed spectral features perhaps is you know of order a few tenths okay um, so that is the basic idea of how the power law emission is made. And you will remember, for example, from Rybicki and Lightman's book that uh, Compton upscattering is a quite effective way to form a power law. You can start with a non-power uh, law source. Originally, uh, the accretion disk, you Compton upscatter it, and you can produce a power law. And, and that that tends to be the case uh, once you, again, average over all of these multiple orders of Compton scattering that may be occurring, averaging over the um, various geometries that many photons at different locations across the disk follow. In general, you end up expecting something like a power law to be produced, and indeed that is what is observed. Okay, 
Now, the power law, well, we can measure um, the, the slope of the power law. That's the primary interesting parameter of the power law, aside from its overall normalization level, is its slope. So we measure the so-called photon index of the power law. Uh, it's typically written as gamma. And gamma is defined here. It's defined such that the number of photons that we measure at a given energy is proportional to the energy to the minus gamma power. So the, so the, the number of photons is dropping off as you go to higher energies. And it's dropping off with this typical power law slope. Um, the power law slope, again, on a log log uh, plot, would be, be between about 1.7 and 2.2. There's interesting intrinsic differences from one active galaxy to another. Um, some of them tend to be all around 1.7. Other ones tend to be 2 and above. And in fact, there are interesting correlations. Uh, we indeed uh, know, in fact, my group was involved in uh, establishing this for the first time, that um, the power law slope appears to correlate with the Eddington ratio of uh, the accretion. So uh, higher Eddington ratio uh, accretors tend to have steeper power law slopes in general than lower Eddington ratio accretors. And there's a whole interesting phenomenology there, which I won't go into here, but you can read about in the literature if you're interested. Um, one other point about the corona I want to make in passing, um, this will be relevant later, is the corona... Uh, may well have multiple temperature phases. Again, you can see here that the corona is a complex structure. It is perhaps unreasonable to expect that the, cor that the corona will have all a uniform temperature everywhere, although that is the first modeling approximation people tend to make. Um, however, as we will see, um, some observed uh, phenomena of active galaxies are, are best understood if you allow the corona to in fact have multiple temperatures, which seems very physically plausible to me. It seems hard that you would manage to regulate all this plasma, perhaps spanning a wide range of radius away from the accretion disk, all having exactly the same temperature. And so the next approximation people often make is to separate the corona into a so-called hot corona and then a cool corona, where the hot corona would be the billion Kelvin one that makes the power law that we've been talking about now. And we will talk more about the cool corona and what it might do in a couple of slides. Now, of course, this is the next order approximation where you allow there to be two phases. Although I think probably that's even too simple to be realistic. I think quite possibly the corona may have a wide range of temperatures. Uh, although presently we cannot diagnose um, you know, the corona at a level where we can work out its full complex temperature structure. But that should be kept in mind uh, when, when thinking about the modeling that, that people are doing of the corona. Okay, um, now <clears throat> another point I want to make is about this power law cutoff. As I've already highlighted several times, the X-ray power law cuts off. It cuts off in roughly an exponential form. Um, and the general observed cutoff energy is typically sort of between about 80 in 300 keV. And here is a plot that, that shows this. This is one example paper. There are many other such papers. In this plot, uh, the, the authors are showing the luminosity of the active galaxy versus the cutoff energy. And you can see the cutoff energies go down to typically maybe around 80 keV or so, and then go up to a order 300 keV or so. Okay, And there's many complex things labeled on this plot. Um, now, um, what does that mean? Well, that cutoff is thought to be arising uh, due to the finite temperature of the coronal plasma. Um, the plasma has a certain characteristic temperature, and it can't produce photons of energies much above that. So you get a cutoff. Okay, now then why does the coronal plasma have the temperature that it does, and why isn't it much hotter than it is? There certainly is plenty of energy being liberated in this region, so why is it not even hotter? Well, the current thinking there is that um, electron-positron pair production, at least in some cases, may play an important role in acting as a thermostat for the corona. Uh, the idea here is that if you have a corona, go back to this plot here, for example, and you, you start feeding more energy into it, well, if you're up uh, at temperatures where electron-positron pair of production can occur, so you feed some energy into the corona, that makes the particles move faster 
to some degree, but then these particles, move, now on account of having moving faster, collide with greater velocities and can pair produce. And so the energy that you originally feed in to try to heat up the corona instead going, goes into producing more particles, electrons and positrons as pairs. And so uh, in this sense, um, you know, adding more energy doesn't raise the typical velocities of the particles, thermalized velocity that corresponded to the temperature, uh, but, but instead it just causes more particles to be created. So that, that in a nutshell, and again, there, there are many complexities there for sure, um, you know, illustrates how the um, electron-positron pair may serve as kind of a thermostat for the corona, and um, that caught, that that's that's what leads to this observed cutoff of the power law. Okay, so that's the power law cutoff, and that's what I will say for now uh, regarding our very brief uh, discussion um, of the power law. Now, let's move on now to this soft X-ray excess. As I've already mentioned in our little schematic, we often observe strong excess X-ray emission over and above what you would expect from an extrapolation of the power law down to low energies. Um, here is a plot, uh, just one slide, sort of illustrating some of the key points about the soft X-ray excess. Here is a nice example of a very strong soft X-ray excess, which you can see is detected at very high statistical significance uh, over and above uh, the extrapolation of the power law down to low energies, which would go like that. So you have this enormous soft X-ray excess in this case. Um, and, well, what can we say about this? Well, the first thing you can do is you can just try to fit it with some spectral models. People do that. Oftentimes, somewhat surprisingly, um, the soft X-ray excess can be fit not too badly with just a single, by adding a single black body that soaks up all these residuals over and above the power law. Um, <coughs> now, um, again, the, 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 the um, soft X-ray excess, well, is generally confined to low X-ray energies, soft X-rays. And, and so it is generally confined to below one and a half keV. It often is below a keV or even below, you know, 0.8 or even less uh, keV in energy. Now, this, um, the, the, the nature of the soft X-ray excess then is uh, still a bit of a mystery. Um, it is too hot uh, to be um, consistent with what you would naturally expect from a standard thin accretion disk, as we've been discussing earlier on. The disk, at least for these more massive black holes, never gets hot enough to make um, soft X-ray excess emission up at these sorts of uh, uh, energies. And indeed, you know, in many cases, we can measure the black hole mass, and we find the soft X-ray excess is far too high, far extends far too high in energy compared to expectations given what we know of the system, including its measured black hole mass. Okay, so it often appears too hot to be entirely from a standard accretion disk. Moreover, and this is even worse, uh, the soft X-ray excess is often rapidly variable. It is often as, as variable as the power law, and sometimes even more variable than the power law. So this soft X-ray excess, again, varies rapidly and by large amplitudes. Now that causes a real challenge if you wanted to propose its thermal emission from an accretion disk, because how do you get a thermal accretion disk to vary rapidly by large amplitudes, you know, going, you know, increasing in luminosity by a factor of two or more on time scales of an hour or less? I mean, do, do you think the accretion disk gets hotter all at once or gets bigger or, or what? I mean, it becomes very problematic. So the variability also causes you know doom for any model that would want to propose it's just from a standard uh, accretion disk uh, thermally emitting and, and so instead uh, the current thinking is that the um, soft x-ray excess is perhaps a combination of things and different processes may dominate in in different agns but uh, the, the thinking is that there may be a combination of accretion disk thermal emission perhaps at the very lowest energies but also emission from a cool corona Remember, I just was talking about how the corona may have multiple temperature phases associated with it. Well, here is a nice uh, SED modeling where they allow the corona to have two phases, a hot phase, the hot Compton scattering phase, which produces the power law, and then a cooler phase, which Compton upscatters more modestly some of the thermal emission from the disk and thereby produces this soft X-ray excess. 
that sort of a model where you have a cool Compton component could be much more effective, for example, at producing these higher energies uh, of the soft excess that are observed and perhaps allowing some decent degree of variability. Um, that's another possibility. And then furthermore, uh, you may have uh, reflection, and I'll explain exactly what I mean by reflection uh, shortly, um, or emission lines from the accretion disk. Those things may contribute to the soft X-ray excess as well. Okay, so that's a soft X-ray excess. And then our final continuum component is the so-called Compton reflection hump. This broadband hump observed up here, peaking between of order 20 and 40 keV or so. Well, you can probably guess from the name that it's going to have something to do with Compton reflection, whatever that may be. And so we'll talk about that now. Okay, so to, to talk about that, um, well, we're going to go back to our little diagram here, which I've showed previously. And now I want to talk about this little process over here, which thus far I have not discussed. So the idea for the Compton reflection hump is that it is produced it, when you have X-rays um, that have been made in the corona via Compton upscattering that by chance shine back down upon the accretion disk. Okay, so X-rays made in the corona often will shine back down upon the accretion disk and irradiate it. Okay, <clears throat> and when that happens, well, a number of things can happen for an X-ray that is incident upon the accretion disk. Um, one thing that can happen is it can be photoelectrically absorbed. It can be absorbed by the disk uh, and then be thermalized and then be re-emitted. That's not very interesting from an emission point of view here, although clearly it could be relevant for powering the disk generally. Um, and I'll say more about that later on. Um, another thing that can happen is that the X-ray photon incident upon the disk can be Compton scattered back out. So here is an X-ray that's been Compton scattered back out. And so what you end up with is a competition between the relevant possible photon processes, which again, at least at low energies, are photoelectric absorption and Compton scattering. And basically at low energies, photoelectric absorption tends to win. But then as you go to progressively higher energies, Compton scattering begins to win. And here is a nice little schematic that illustrates this. So here is a power law. I think that, that's labeled as B here. And then it shows what happens when you take that power law and you shine it down upon one of these accretion disks. And here is the result of some detailed modeling uh, done by my colleague uh, and friend Giorgio Mott. And um, here you can see that, well, as you pr progress toward relatively higher X-ray energies, well, the um, Compton scattering becomes more effective and the overall spectral emission from this reflection process gets stronger and stronger. Down here, photoelectric absorption is winning. P -p Progressively, as you go to higher energies, Compton scattering tends to win. Then you get some line emission, which we will talk about soon. And then you get a big drop in the emissivity due to the iron absorption edge, which is shown here. But then again, the emission rises back up as Compton scattering again becomes more and more important. And you get this broadband emission kind of peaking like that. And you add that on top of the power law and you can get a large fractional contribution compared to the power law up here at high energies whereas down here the power law is very strong so whatever reflection may be present is much weaker fractionally but up here you have a large fractional contribution from this Compton scattering this Compton reflection of x-rays back out of the disk <coughs> and that's what produces this broadband hump this Compton reflection hump that I'm showing here. Okay, that's the basic idea. Um, whoops. Um, so that's what causes the rise of the Compton hump on the low end. Now notice the Compton hump drops off toward high energies. Now one basic reason for that is the power law is starting to cut off, at least in some cases. And so that will make the Compton reflection hump go down because there aren't as many irradiating photons anymore. Uh, however, other factors are also very relevant up here. In, in particular, remember, we're dealing with Compton scattering. And so high energy photons um, that strike the disk, even if they're Compton reflected back out, will suffer Compton recoil. The electron doing the scattering will recoil and thereby steal some of the energy from the X-ray. And so that takes the X-rays that are higher energy and migrates them downward in energy, pushing them more toward the hump. Okay, that's another factor that can be relevant. And then finally, uh, for those of you who uh, 
uh, know a little bit about quantum electrodynamics, uh, you, you may know that the cross-section for Compton scattering also drops off as the um, photon energy becomes non-negligible compared to the rest mass energy of the electron. That is known as the Klein-Nishina cross-section as opposed to the Thomson cross-section. So <coughs> the scattering cross-section also drops up here and that causes the hump to decline at high energies. And so you get this broadband hump which um, is important for a while as Compton scattering beats out um, photoelectric absorption, but ultimately it has to decline for the various reasons I've just mentioned. So you end up with this broadband hump. Now, of course, this, this um, broadband hump is formed in the immediate vicinity of the black hole. This material is orbiting around the black hole at high speeds. Uh, there is beaming of radiation. There are general relativistic light bending effects. And so when you work out what this Compton hump will actually look like, you have to propagate it through all of these effects as well. And that is generally done, um, usually, one hopes, uh, when comparing with actual data. Okay, so that's the Compton reflection hump. And that's <coughs> the end of our discussion of the continuum components. Now I would like to discuss some of the discrete atomic features uh, that are also observed. I'll start with the iron K line and with other line emission. Okay, so here is this iron K line. I've alluded to it already, and I have, I have some things to say about the iron K line. So uh, the iron K line is thought to be made via a process known as iron fluorescence. Um, th this is, of course, when an X-ray knocks out an N equals one level uh, electron in an iron atom and an N equals two electron falls down to fill the hole and thereby produces a fluorescent line photon. That's the idea of the, of the process. Now, now, this process can occur in the um, accretion disk as, uh, oops, a, as shown here. Um, it, can, it can occur in the accretion disk, kind of like the Compton reflection hump. In this case, uh, an, an illuminating X-ray photon shines down upon the disk, again, interacts with an iron atom, and causes a fluorescent iron line photon to be produced. So that's where that comes out. So this has many connections to the Compton reflection hump, although now it's an iron, uh, an iron um, atom interacting with the X-ray down in the disk instead of a, uh, an electron. Um, <clears throat> so that's one place where you can get this... Um, iron production via fluorescence. However, it's not the only one. Um, any other structures that are present in the nuclear region will also produce iron um, line emission. For example, you have x-rays being produced down here on very small scales. They can shine out upon the obscuring torus. And x-rays interacting with the torus can also cause iron line emission to be produced out there. So that's another place you can get iron emission. You may also get iron emission when X-rays uh, irradiate broadline um, region uh, gas, and X-rays could be made that way. Uh, and there's a variety of other possibilities. Uh, any material with a decent uh, optical thickness to fairly high energy X-rays will produce iron line emission, at least to some degree. Now, <clears throat> the, the nature of the iron line emission in terms of its spectral profile will be different uh, depending on those different scenarios. So I, I will say more about that in a minute. J just a couple of other points very quickly. So the iron, uh, iron, you might ask, why is the iron line so strong? Where are all the other lines from silicon and sulfur and magnesium and oxygen and carbon and so on? Well, it turns out iron <clears throat> is by far the most effective element at line production. Uh, there, there are two reasons for that. Uh, the first is that um, iron is a very abundant element, so that tends to help it in terms of line production. Uh, secondly, iron, owing to its relatively high atomic number, has a high fluorescent yield. That is, every time you get one of these uh, fluorescent interactions, two things can happen. You can either have an Auger ionization where you kick an electron out of the, out of the atom, uh, or you can have a fluorescent line photon that actually gets away. Um, now, that that process, the fraction of the time you actually get an x-ray coming out, a fluorescent x-ray coming out, is known as the fluorescent yield. For iron, it's around 30%, whereas for things like carbon, it's vastly lower. Okay, so these are some atomic or atomic physics coming into play there um, that also explains why iron is particularly an effective emitter. So iron has the highest product of abundance and fluorescent yield by a wide margin. So that's why iron is the best uh, emitter. 
Okay. Now then, um, <clears throat> as I've said, uh, if you have iron line emission being made in the vicinity of a black hole, well, again, the material here is orbiting at very high speeds. Uh, you have uh, light bending effects due to the black hole, and all of those things have to be considered when you work out what the profile of the iron line will be. Okay, you'll get Doppler shifts, for example, due to the very rapid motion in the vicinity of the black hole, as well as many other things that I will talk about in a minute. On the other hand, if you have iron emission coming from this obscuring torus much further out, where the velocities are much smaller, note the orbital timescales out here, or order years, um, well, then the line will be much less broadened. Okay, and so people go and they try to measure these iron lines to diagnose what's going on in the accretion disk or what's going on in the torus and so on. Now we're gonna focus, given that we're talking about the black hole region here, about this sort of process. Although one has to remember that there may be contributions from the disk and the torus and everything else all at once, which makes some of the modeling actually a, a, a challenge. Uh, nevertheless, um, <clears throat> if one considers the black hole region, well, uh, if you have x-rays shining down upon this accretion disk, and, and here's a nice sort of illustration of the various relevant factors. Well, first of all, you'll get line broadening because you know one side of the disk is um, moving uh, toward us, uh, the other side is moving away, so the line gets naturally broadened just due to standard Newtonian Doppler shifts. Then you also have to consider special relativistic effects. Uh, remember, uh, you have beaming of the emission on the side of the disk that is approaching us and, um, and that beaming is toward us, and on the other side, the beaming is away from us. So you expect the blue side of the line to be considerably stronger than the red side of the line. There is also the transverse Doppler shift to be considered. And then <clears throat> if you go to the next level of complexity, you also have to consider general relativity. And that is there is a, for example, gravitational redshift. Uh, because the photons have to, have to climb their way up out of the gravitational potential close to the black hole. And that will cause this whole line to be shifted downward in energy, as shown here. And so you put all these things together and you expect a line profile that is like this. It is broad and it is significantly skewed okay, uh, toward the red due to the effects I've just described, the beaming effect, the gravitational redshift, and so on. And so people go out and measure these lines, and, and lo and behold, you measure them, and, and at least in some cases, you find lines that appear to be broad and skewed, exactly like you might expect. Now, uh, there's a couple things to be said. First of all, you can just look at the characteristic width of the line, and you know, just ballparking it by eye, you can see the line is a couple keV broad, and it's out of order, you know, it's rest frame energy for this line is in fact 6.4 keV. So a couple keV broad at 6.4 keV means you're looking at velocities of several tenths the speed of light. So this material is moving very fast, okay? And you go all the way down to here and you're going up to a large fraction of the speed of light. <clears throat> so just the width alone implies that the... Uh, material is moving very fast and likely is coming from the black hole, at least to some significant degree. Now, again, detailed modeling of these line profiles gets much more complicated because remember, you have multiple sites that could be producing the line. You have a disk, but you also have other material. So you have to then try to disentangle things and say, well, okay, how much of this narrow component of the line here is due to the accretion disk emission, which you do expect there to be some there. You have a bright... Uh, peak there, but you also have to ask, well, how much of that instead could be not just due to the disk, but, but could be due to the torus? So you have to dis try to disentangle that. Now you can do that to some degree using variability and such, but it, it's a challenging thing to do. Um, and, um, and, and so on. And so people have developed sophisticated ways of modeling these lines. They try to disentangle all the components. And with very high signal to noise data, people have, uh, with some success, uh, used measurements like these to estimate the uh, inclination of the accretion disk, which seems to agree with other measurements in many cases. They also constrain the disk emissivity, that is how much emission is there at different disk radii as one goes outward. Uh, and then furthermore, some uh, very brave souls have attempted to measure black hole spin as well. Uh, this depends significantly upon modeling the details of this broad red 
tail of the line. And, and there could be challenges because your detailed modeling of that can become degenerate with your modeling of the continuum unless you've measured the continuum very well. And um, th there, there are a number of other challenges uh, th that can arise as well. If you have absorbing material in, in the system, you have to try to disentangle absorption effects from this very broad red wing, and that can be challenging. But nevertheless, um, some people think they can do this. Perhaps they're correct, and that would be great. And um, you may be able to, in fact, measure black hole spins as well, which is which is very exciting. And it's good people are pushing on these things and trying to gather better and better data to to answer these important questions. Okay. Um, now I want to mention that in addition to the iron K line, we sometimes observe other line emission. Here's a nice example. In this case, you see the iron K line here again. Um, it, it is, you know, peaked here toward the blue, has a skew red tail. And um, in some cases, there is evidence that you not only see iron K emission, but also iron L emission. Here is evidence for broad iron L emission in this particular active galaxy. That one's an old friend of mine, in fact. And um, uh, here, well, that other line emission is now getting down to fairly low energies. That may contribute to the observed soft X-ray excess that I've been talking about. In some cases, more. In other cases, less. Uh, and but, but generally, you know, blending with other soft excess components can make the detailed modeling of this line challenging in some cases. Although, again, you can use variability measurements to try to disentangle much of that. So there's exciting work being done studying all this line emission. There's a whole literature here that you, I encourage you to check out if you have interest. Okay, so um, finally, I just want to say a few words about these absorbing outflows as the final example of discrete atomic features. So uh, in some cases, we observe many additional uh, discrete atomic features imposed upon the spectrum from absorbing outflows. I've deliberately not shown them in this schematic, trying to keep it as simple as possible. But now I'm going to show you what happens if you go and observe this with a high-resolution spectrometer, and specifically the grading spectrometers on the Chandra X-ray Observatory. We're going to take one of these active galaxies. And this is what um, Shai Caspian colleagues, he, he was a postdoctoral researcher in my group when these measurements were made, uh, this is what you see if you take the Chandra gratings and you observe a bright nearby active galaxy for nearly a million seconds. So this is a very long exposure on this well-studied active galaxy. And uh, you can see that not only do you have the iron line, which you see up here very nicely, uh, but you also see large numbers of other spectral features. Um, and you might say down here, well, what is all this stuff? Why does this look like a forest of grass down here? Is this all just noise? And if so, why with a million seconds of data are your data so noisy? Well, th none of this is noise. This is almost all signal. Very little of this is noise, to be more precise. This is almost all signal. What you're seeing here is a forest of hundreds of X-ray absorption lines, okay? In this case, being formed in ionized gas, a so-called ionized absorber or warm absorber, and these are commonly seen in uh, unobscured active galaxies. Um, and this material is thought to be due to a wind uh, blowing outward at high speed from the active nucleus. Now, to convince you that these are all real spectral features, I'm going to show you one more plot because this gets to be very complicated. So to illustrate that more clearly, here is a uh, broader uh, display of the, the um, grading spectrum of NGC 3783. In this case, we have four panels, each of which is labeled with uh, wavelength along the lower axis and then energy along the upper axis, and these panels connect with each other. So this one runs from 1.5 to some up above four angstroms, then continues here, then continues here, then continues here. And when you spread this out, you can see all of these absorption lines uh, that are present uh, in coming, coming from that uh, ionized absorbing material. And uh, labeled are the various transitions from neon, magnesium, aluminum, um, sulfur, uh, argon, uh, calcium, and, and so on. So you can see on uh, silicon, you can see large numbers of transitions um, <clears throat> matching up with where the uh, observed lines are. 
There's also a huge forest of iron uh, absorbing lines superimposed on uh, much of the spectrum as well. So the point is that um, these ionized outflows can produce huge numbers of additional um, spectral features in, in these uh, active galaxies. And, and these spectral features can be used to constrain the properties of these ionized outflows. Indeed, the reason why we know these are outflows is you can measure the Doppler shifts of these absorption lines. And for example, in NGC 3783, the outflow is quite fast, reaching up to like a million miles an hour or so. So there's large numbers of uh, absorbing lines. There also are absorption edges, photoelectric absorption edges from the ionized gas, for example, from highly ionized oxygen there and there and so on. And there's, there's other complex features, radiative recombination continua, unresolved transition arrays of absorbing lines and so on. So anyway, <clears throat> a lot of interesting uh, spectral complexity there, a lot of rich diagnostic capability uh, encoded in all these lines. You can measure the uh, typical column densities of this material, ranges often between about 10 to the 21 and 10 to the 23 particles per square centimeter of just of hydrogen. And moreover, this absorbing uh, gas, uh, absorbing outflow, often appears to be in multiple phases, uh, with, with some gas more highly ionized than other gas. And um, again, we will talk much more about these uh, uh, ionized uh, X-ray absorbers <clears throat> a little bit later on, but um, some of these uh, may well come from fairly close to the black hole, maybe from a wind launch from the accretion disk or a wind launch from the torus. And um, finally, I will just mention that um, some of uh, these outflows uh, observed in the X-ray may also be related or almost surely are related to uh, similar uh, absorbing features seen in the ultraviolet, uh, specifically um, some of those um, with uh, high ionization. Okay, so I'll say more about uh, these uh, absorbing outflows in a later uh, lecture. Um, I will just also just want to remind you that in addition to uh, that sort of ionized absorber, uh, in many active galaxies, the type 2 systems, for example, we observe a lot of X-ray absorption by neutral gas. And <clears throat> that works via photoelectric absorption. Here I show uh, the effects of that photoelectric absorption on that typical AGN spectral energy distribution uh, for the case of a fully covering X-ray screen, so a rather simple geometry. And what essentially happens is as you increase the, the amount of obscuring material following this sort of column density here, the amount of uh, X-ray absorption grows and basically imposes a absorption cutoff that systematically marches upward in energy as you increase the column density, as you're seeing here. Okay, now in reality, oftentimes uh, AGN absorption is much more complex than the simple picture that I'm showing here, um, depending, for example, upon details of the geometry. And we will talk more about that soon, in fact, when we talk a little bit about uh, variable uh, absorption in some of these systems. And so uh, just to wrap up this discussion on uh, spectral measurements, I just want to add a few brief points about radio loud active galactic nuclei. So most of what I've been talking about so far has focused on radio quiet active galactic nuclei, the simplest systems possible where one can study the corona, uh, the, the, the x-ray reflection off the disk, the soft excess, the, the, the uh, absorbing features and so on. But what about the radio loud systems where you have a significant jet present in the system as well? Well, <clears throat> there have been quite a few uh, spectral studies of these systems over the years. Um, and the, the current thinking that the best results that I'm aware of uh, indicate that for most radio loud quasars, so these are luminous radio loud active galaxies, uh, leaving aside again the blazars, um, most of these appear to show dominant coronal x-ray emission as well as reflection features, similar to what is seen for radio quiet AGNs and also connecting rather well with what is seen for black hole x-ray binaries that launch jets. In fact, this is a significant change compared to previous thinking where years ago people in fact thought that most of the um, X-ray emission from radio loud active galaxies indeed primarily came from the jet itself or from some strongly jet linked emission. Okay, so 
We think it's coronal emission um, from, from, from the, at least the luminous radio loud systems as well, the quasars. Um, <clears throat> and another notable finding, which is sort of illustrated in this diagram, is that um, for these radio loud quasars, as you um, dial up the jet power, going from a radio quiet system to a moderately radio loud system, which often at least probably has a moderate strength jet to a highly radio loud system, which has a much stronger jet. Um, interestingly, the strength of the coronal emission seems to dial up as you dial up the jet. In other words, there seems to be a corona jet connection in these systems. As you dial up the jet, the corona correspondingly grows in intensity as well. Okay, and again, you can read more about that in, in these recent works, um, which in fact challenge uh, some of the previous uh, established knowledge on the topic. Um, so that's the, the luminous radio loud systems um, as best we understand them. Now for the um, lower luminosity radio AGNs, uh, the so-called radio galaxies, for example, where you don't have this luminous quasar component present. Um, well, many of these uh, appear to be accreting via one of these radiatively inefficient accretion flows that I alluded to earlier on. And um, for these, well, most of their accretion power seems to be channeled into their jets. And so we'll say more about this later when we start talking about jets. But for now, this will have to do for the radio loud AGNs. There's clearly much more that can be said here. And if you're interested, I encourage you to check out the literature. Okay, so that's X-ray spectral studies of the black hole region. Now I would like to move on and talk some about X-ray variability studies and what they have taught us about the black hole region. Okay, so again, this is the same slide I showed you previously. The first thing that X-ray variability studies do for us is indeed they establish that um, most of the X-ray emission is coming from a quite compact region, okay, with a size of light hours or less. And so I won't repeat that. We've already talked about this slide in detail earlier. Um, however, there are interesting things uh, that, that, that can be established just from basic studies of this variability. Here is one nice finding. Uh, interestingly, and kind of as one might physically expect or, or hope for, you generally see stronger X-ray variability, at least on fairly short time scales, a day or less or so, um, for um, lower black hole mass. And so this plot shows basically a, a measure of variability uh, above and beyond uh, the, the uh, variability just due to statistical measurement errors versus the black hole mass along this axis. And you can see for lower mass black hole systems, which are physically smaller, uh, they vary more on short time scales than do the very massive systems. And you might plausibly expect that, um, you know, just because these systems have bigger light crossing times, there may be more uh, coronal components in them that tend to average out, where for the smaller systems, you get larger amplitude variability. So there's a nice correlation there. And, and I will just mention in passing, there are, there are also interesting correlations with Eddington fraction and, and with other quantities um, that have been found from these basic studies of uh, X-ray variability. Now, people have also um, used power spectra to study variability, to quantify AGN variability. So what people then do is they gather light curves that sample as wide a range of time scales as possible. Here are four active galaxies from this particular study um, that have been monitored for a long period of time with rather low sampling density, but which also have sort of um, much more intense monitoring, okay, over um, more limited time scales. And basically then the, the, the long-term variability lets you constrain low frequency variability in the power spectrum and, and the densely sampled stuff lets you sample higher frequencies. And you put all that together and look to see what you find. And power spectral analyses establish a number of things. First of all, um, <clears throat> the AGN variability power spectra usually do not show periodicity or quasi-periodicity. Uh, these systems don't seem usually, and I'll talk about a couple of exceptions later, to show obvious periods or quasi-periods. Um, that's kind of unfortunate because it'd be great to be able to use those as diagnostics of the system, but usually we don't have those. For your typical AGN, 
broadly speaking, uh, you observe sort of random chaotic variability. And to be a little more specific, you observe a, a red noise power spectrum. And so that's what's being shown here. Um, these four power spectra, which show again power, variability power as a function of frequency, which are obtained by Fourier transforming essentially these light curves. Um, well, they, they show, for example, that the amount of variability power rises toward low frequencies, as you might expect. Things vary more on, on long time scales than they do on short time scales, okay? And so you have this sort of variability power spectrum rising toward, uh, toward uh, low uh, frequencies. And again, there are four systems shown here corresponding to the four light curves shown here. So you see red noise power spectra, broadly speaking. Now, it's, things are a little more complex. You, by fitting these power spectra, people have been able to establish that there is generally a bend or a break in the power spectrum. <clears throat> and you can see that in these plots where here, for example, take this system. The power spectrum is rising more rapidly here going to low frequencies and then makes a break to a, a more gradual slope. Uh, down here. And the same thing in general for these. There's a break there. There's a break there. There's a break there. Okay. And these bend break time scales correspond to sort of 0 0.1 to 100 days. And I'll say more about them uh, in a minute. So one thing you can do is you can just compare these sort of variability power spectra with those of galactic black hole systems. And generally speaking, the AGN studied usually resemble galactic black holes in their so-called soft state. Galactic black holes have a number of spectral and variability states. And, and um, the AGNs that are studied in, in these studies usually correspond to soft state galactic black holes. Um, <clears throat> now, you can also then, while well, you can measure these bend-break time scales and look to see if they correlate with other AGN physical properties. And, and quite a bit of work has been done on that. Here is just one example of a whole uh, body of literature on this. In this case, uh, the break time scale measured from the power spectrum seems to correlate with the black hole mass. And you can see that here. Luminous AGNs, uh, excuse me, uh, high mass uh, black hole, uh, AGNs with ma more massive black holes have longer break time scales. AGNs with uh, lower mass uh, black holes have shorter break time scales. And they, you can see the break time scale spans orders of magnitude in this diagram. Okay. In fact, more detailed analyses find that the break time scale scales as the black hole mass to about the 1.17 power, so it's nearly a linear relation there, and then inversely proportional to the Eddington ratio to the minus 0.9 power. So that's the kind of relation that, that one finds, uh, broadly speaking. And it, notably, um, this simple formula here actually seems to describe well both galactic black holes and AGNs, kind of unifying these systems, you know, in, in the sense that AGNs uh, appear to behave, at least in some ways, like scaled up galactic black holes. And that's what's shown in this plot down here. Here you're showing the observed break time scale versus the predicted break time scale from a simple scaling like this. And you see here are the active galaxies, and you apply the same thing to the galactic black holes, Cygnus X1, GRS 1915 plus 105, they're down there. So there seems to be there a prospects at least for an interesting unification of supermassive black hole and stellar mass black hole systems. So that's an example of sort of a one of the things that emerges from power spectrum analyses of AG and variability. And again, there's a large body of work here with many interesting findings. This is just one of them. Okay. I also want to mention that uh, variability can also be utilized for what are known as reverberation studies. The, the idea here is that you um, can watch a sort of driving light curve vary. And then as that radiation shines out upon the physical system under investigation, you can watch how that system reverberates in response to the illumination of the primary source. That, that overall idea is referred to as reverberation. Okay, well, people have performed that kind of reverberation mapping. In fact, this is a whole industry, or actually several industries. Uh, there are multiple types of reverberation studies, as shown in this nice diagram. You can use X-ray reverberation mapping to study the black hole region. That's what's going to be most relevant here. You can also look for uh, 
a, a, a reverberation where the x-rays may shine upon the accretion disk. For example, the accretion disk emission in the optical and ultraviolet. And you can see if that reverberates in response to the x-rays. I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, you can also look uh, at for reverberation where uh, a radiation from the central region shines upon the emission line clouds and, and you can reverberation map that structure. And indeed, you can use that to try to estimate the black hole's mass. That's one of the main ways that we get reliable black hole masses in the distant universe. And then um, finally, you can also do dust reverberation mapping where you study how the uh, dust in the obscuring materials, the torus, uh, reverberates in response to changes of the continuum. There's multiple types of reverberation mapping. For now, I will focus on the um, X-ray reverberation mapping, and we'll have plenty to say about these other ones uh, soon enough. Okay, so X-ray reverberation mapping uh, basically involves looking at different parts of the X-ray spectrum uh, and, and watching how they reverberate um, off each other. Uh, you basically can look to see, do we see, for example, uh, the coronal emission varying first and then the reflection uh, varying in response to the changes of the corona? And, you know, broadly speaking, to summarize a, a large literature, uh, X-ray reverberation mapping uh, largely confirms the basic correctness of the corona plus X-ray reflection feature that was previously deduced from the X-ray spectroscopy. So the variability and the spectroscopy all seem to hold together pretty well. So that's, that's very nice. Um, furthermore, uh, these um, sort of reverberation studies have usefully constrained the geometry of the corona. Uh, in fact, these reverberation studies generally support coronae extended over tens of gravitational radii, at least in some sources, instead of having one of those simple you know, highly concentrated lamppost coronae uh, that I mentioned earlier. And so we're learning things about the corona geometry from these reverberation studies as well. Now, the, the whole uh, matter of exactly how to do these studies reliably gets to be very complicated. You have to do all the relativistic ray tracing. You have to consider various complexities about how the um, X-ray reflection is working and so on. And, and if you want to see those details, uh, you know, you, you can check the literature. But these are some of the main things that have emerged from X-ray reverberation studies of the black hole region. Just, just I also want to mention briefly about how emission from the black hole region may affect the disk a little bit further out, the disk uh, where it is emitting optical and ultraviolet continuum emission. And here the results are, well, fascinating and, and also puzzling in some ways. Um, here are some nice plots gathered from intensive studies of two active galaxies that have been very intensively observed with, in this case, the, the SWIFT satellite. And uh, SWIFT is able to observe uh, these systems over a broad uh, range of um, energy or, or frequency, uh, starting in the fairly hard X-rays, and then down to the soft X-rays, and then in an ultraviolet band, and then in another ultraviolet band at somewhat longer wavelength, and another ultraviolet band, and then going down here, um, you know, and I believe much of this may be from, from ground-based data, from, from, you know, in the U band, in the B band, in the V band, and so on. Okay, so you have um, all of these measurements for this particular active galaxy, a very well-studied system, NGC 5548, and note this is spanning a long time scale, okay? Note the, the time scale being spanned here is of order 100 days or so with intensive monitoring over that whole period. Um, <clears throat> here's another example. Here's NGC 4051, another very famous well-studied active galaxy. And again, here are the X-ray light curves and then the longer wavelength light curves here. And well, a, a number of things have emerged from, from these studies. And I will just mention that there are many other active galaxies that have been studied now comparably well to these, although these remain some of the best. Um, one notable finding, which you can see just from looking at, at, at these light curves here, is that the X-ray varies up and down in an erratic, complicated manner, as one would expect. And there's some degree of coherence, as one would expect, between, for example, the hard X-rays and the soft X-rays. You can see that little dip there, lines with that dip there. But there is much less correspondence once you start going to the ultraviolet bands and the optical bands. Okay, you can see that here. 
a lot of this chaotic up and down variability doesn't seem to be reflected in the longer wavelength variability. And the same thing here for NGC 4151. And this basic fact can be established in more detail with correlation analyses that show a more limited degree of correlation between the X-ray bands uh, compared to these longer wavelength bands, they undo the longer wavelength bands with themselves. You notice for, for these longer wavelength bands running from the ultraviolet through to the optical, there's a very good degree of correlation. This rise here aligns with this rise here and there and there and there and there. So there's very good degree correlation degree of correlation there. In the X-rays things, well, less, less so, although there may be some degree of correlation there. Okay, so the point is that the X-ray versus ultraviolet optical correlations are often weak. And this challenges simple reprocessing models where one might imagine that you have this X-ray corona varying and those variations in the corona again shine out further onto the disc out into the optical and ultraviolet region and, and, and thereby drive and power the variation seen at those longer wavelengths. If that were the case, one would expect a better degree of correlation between the X-ray light curves and the optical ultraviolet light curves quite likely um, than what is observed. So that's a challenge to this idea of, of at least this kind of reprocessing where the corona drives the variations of the optical UV continuum reverberation region. Okay. In other words, they may not be reverberating, at least in the, the sense that we're imagining here. Or there may be other complexities as, uh, regarding this reverberation process. And so people are still investigating exactly what that means. And, and then just in passing, I do want to show you uh, another uh, sort of connection between the X-ray variability and longer wavelengths. And I want to show you how well um, these... Um, different optical and, and ultraviolet bands correlate with each other. Here you can see, in fact, lags measured. So these bands correlate with each other, but with a lag. Okay, and you can see here the the, the shorter wavelengths. This rise happens first, and then it, it's it's lagged as one goes to progressively longer wavelengths. Like you're moving outward in an accretion disk, and the same thing here for NGC forty one fifty one. And so people, in fact, measure that lag as a function of wavelength. And for now, let's just start by focusing on these lower panels. Here basically are measurements for four active galaxies, including 5548 and 4151, the one shown here, as well as some other ones that are very well studied. And one can see that the lag scales with the wavelength. And when you fit that quantitatively, in fact, the wavelength dependence of the ultraviolet and optical interband lags well, well, that uh, dependence is consistent with expectations for an accretion disk. In other words, the functional form at which this is increasing, in fact, scales as one would expect for an accretion disk, where it is expected to stay scale with an index, a power law index of about four thirds. And the data seem to be actually quite consistent with that, although there are challenges in this band, which may have some level of contamination to it. And again, you can read the papers for all the details. Um, but one challenge, at least initially on the surface, is that the disk size initially appears two to three times larger than expected. So in other words, you get the scaling you would expect for an accretion disk, but the disk appears to be bigger than one would expect. Now, that may not actually be a problem when one considers uh, more realistic uh, models of the corona, and you can read about that in the literature if you're interested. But again, staying focused on the black hole region here, the thing I want to highlight is that these top panels then show the broader band where they don't just show the ultraviolet and optical as shown in these lower panels, but they also include the X-rays going down to just a few angstroms. And you can see the X-rays generally do not agree very well. Sometimes they're below, sometimes they're above the expectations. Okay, Again, indicating that the X-rays don't seem to correlate very well and don't follow the kind of relation of lag versus wavelength as one might expect according to this whole reverberation picture. So this causes some challenge, again, for the idea that the um, ultraviolet optical uh, variations are being driven by um, simple reprocessing of X-ray emission from the corona. So there, there are interesting challenges there, and this is a whole subject of study that people are still working on intensively. Okay. 
Couple of other points uh, before wrapping up uh, on the variability, just to highlight a couple of other aspects of, of variability. We often observe variable X-ray absorption where in an individual active galaxy, we see clear changes in flux and in their spectral shape that are strongly indicative that varying X-ray absorption is the driver of the variations. Here's a uh, nice uh, example of a nearby fairly bright active galaxy. And you see it has these notable spectral changes um, which correspond to large factors in flux. This is a logarithmic scale along here. Um, and the characteristic shape changes are consistent with one would with what one would expect from complex uh, X-ray absorption variations. It's not as simple as that little animation I showed you earlier, but the, the essentials are there and, and the spectral changes here can be quite well understood by varying obscuration along with an underlying constant component that is not subject to that obscuration. So that's this example here. Uh, here is NGC 1068. You'll remember from my uh, first lecture, this was one of the first active galaxies that people ever noticed as being remarkable uh, for its emission line properties. People have now measured its X-ray absorption over time. And here you can see there's variable X-ray absorption by significant factors. Now this material probably is not in the black hole region. It's probably further out in this particular case, but there's significant obscuration variability uh, present in these systems as well. And, and then just to wrap up, um, <clears throat> I wanna show you one other uh, nice example of um, some extreme um, X-ray variability. In some systems, and this is recent quite exciting work, people have discovered quasi-periodic eruptions and quasi-periodic oscillations. So as I said earlier back here, uh, most AGN variability is this general sort of red noise chaotic uh, variation. But in a few systems, there does seem to be a decent degree, there does appear to be a significant degree of periodicity or quasi-periodicity to them. Here's an example um, from, from some recent important work that where they have found an active galaxy that shows quasi-periodic eruptions where the system every once in a while erupts to a high X-ray flux state. I believe this happens about every nine hours or so in this system. <coughs> and... Um, well, what's going on here? Well, that's the interesting thing. I mean, why are there these quasi-periodic eruptions in this system, but not present more generally? Well, we don't know for sure. Um, there are a number of models have been put forward. Uh, one possibility is you may have repeated partial stripping of a captured star by the black hole. Um, remember when I showed you this plot earlier, of you know, a region fairly close to the black hole, which you can see down in this left corner, um, we do expect there to be stars present on, on this scale. They won't be extremely common, but if you look at a large number of active galaxies, it's not unreasonable to think that every once in a while you may have a star that is bound to the black hole and interacting with it. In this case, is being repeatedly tidally stripped uh, by the star. This is plausibly expected sometimes. And so, Perhaps we are here seeing a star being repeatedly stripped of some of its gas, uh, which then shocks and produces much of this emission and then ultimately would be accreted um, <coughs> in, in a system like that. There also are uh, some remarkable cases of so-called quasi-periodic oscillations. I won't go through these in all detail, but just for your reference, here is a nice table that shows the objects where... Um, quasi-periodic oscillations have been plausibly or in many cases credibly found uh, in active galaxies with references which you can go read about if you're interested. Um, unfortunately the nature of these quasi-periodic oscillations are rather perplexing. Uh, they don't seem to correlate very well with one one might expect from x-ray binaries for example and you can read about the details in this paper and in other works. But in any case you know these are examples of uh, you know remarkable extreme variations and I will just tell you there's plenty more where these came from. There are many more uh, examples of fascinating extreme AGN variability of a wide variety of types. <clears throat> so if you're interested in that <clears throat> I refer you to the um, literature and um, furthermore um, <clears throat> in fact there is a nice uh, summary available 
in the um, recordings of this uh, conference, which was held um, in 2023 June. And um, <clears throat> this conference brought together many of the people worldwide who study AG and variability, <clears throat> including the um, X-ray variability from the black hole region, where there was substantial discussion of extreme examples of variability found. And I encourage you to <clears throat> check out the session recordings here as one place to learn more. And I will stop there for today. And uh, thank you.